Well, let's get ready to continue in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. Ever since chapter 14, it's been announcements and warnings of Babylon falling and the explanation why will be in Revelation 18. But uh, for a space of five chapters here, it's, we're coming in and out of this, this, these constant reminders of Babylon falling and the reason for her falling. And, and, and when we get to the end of chapter 17 there, we see that God has in verse chapter 17, verse 17, even put these things in her heart in order to, to accomplish his will through her. We'll talk about that in just a bit. That's a strange concept for people to get a hold of, that God set this in her heart. We'll talk about what that means. But uh, it is, as all of Scripture does, from the very first word onward accomplishes God eternal purpose. Before we begin, let's let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be the church that you established in Christ's name. In doing so, accomplishing your eternal purpose in this body. And through the faith that we trust through Jesus as our head and we as his members, we are grateful, Father, to be children born of your purpose, hopeful still, and assured of overcoming in the faith that we have in Jesus. Father, we're grateful for Charlene's being able to come home. We pray for her healing, for Roger also as he cares for her. Hope they'll be able to be back with us soon. We pray for Milka and the several trials that she is suffering and her desire to, to live for you and to have such a pure and sweet faith. We're thankful for her strong convictions, those things that are enduring her and cause her to endure through these trying times. She too will be traveling to take Isaac for his medical appointments and we pray for her safety and for a, a good outcome and answers to what is needed in that situation. And so we pray also for the minors who will be traveling. We look forward to the time when all of us here those who are sheltered in place and everyone who is part of this congregation will be gathered here together again. And now we pray, Father, for the insight to understand your word, to revel in its promises, and to understand our obligation to keep your commands and hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Revelation chapter 18 begins with the phrase, after these things, John so often says that. It's another way to indicate the progression through these visions. After the previous scene, that is at the end of chapter 17, that glorious scene that speaks of the victory of the Lamb, chapter 17, verse 14 and following there. That glorious victory of, of the Lamb and His being declared the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and all of Him, all of us, the faithful with Him, called the, the, called the chosen and the faithful. That's God's eternal purpose being accomplished in that, to be sure. And in the verses following that, God's purpose also is being accomplished in the judgment of this evil harlot. Let's begin reading in chapter 18, verses 1 through 3. After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven and having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, 
She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. Quite the indictment. So yet another message, Babylon has fallen. In previous chapters, it's announced that's coming. It's Even the sentence has been previously announced, but here it speaks in that sense of a prophetic past tense. It has been fulfilled. Chapter 18 goes back and forth that way quite a bit. Of the wicked, the judgment of them is having been spoken, it's already fulfilled. But then it'll change to the to the future tense or what the faithful even need to do now in the present tense to avoid that faith that's already been announced against the harlot. But Babylon has fallen. Why? Because of willful, flagrant rebellion. Be it Babel, the Tower of Babel in the beginning, or Babylon, First the tower, then the empire. Those, those things were all built by the words of essentially arrogant, babbling fools. That's the word they want to believe. And so what's coming upon them? They're falling. Solomon said in Proverbs 10, verses 8 through 10, The heart of the wise will receive commands. But a babbling fool will be ruined. He who winks the eye causes trouble. And a babbling fool will be ruined. Winking the eye. You know, the wicked think they know something we don't know, don't they? Yeah, we know what God said and all that. But we're going to do it our own way. A little bit different than that. You know, wink, wink. I, I got your back. You know, you got mine. We'll do our own thing. We'll be just fine. Isn't that what they thought even before the final captivity, those, the final third of the Judeans were taken into captivity? Nah, not going to happen. All going to be fine, James. All going to be fine. God will never let Jerusalem be destroyed. The Romans are thinking the same thing. Ah, nothing can touch us. Nothing can touch us. But that's the words of a babbling fool. The... If you go over to Acts chapter 17 and verse 18, there the, the Epicureans and the Stoic Jews, and not just them, but quite a few of the groups of Jews, they accused Paul of being a babbler of strange deities, didn't they? In other words, this, this is certainly not anyone whose word you're going to put your trust in. Just a babbler of strange deities. What's the result of that? What is those who proclaim or declare that the word of God is just so much noise, so much empty words? What's coming upon them? Solomon says they're ruined. Second Peter 2 and verse 1 says they are bringing that ruin upon themselves. It's upon themselves. And broadly speaking, who is it? What, what kind of, of people, what kind of things, what kind of, of people have fallen? What is the kind of people that God from before the beginning has, has judged against? There's a type of people who are called the chosen and the faithful. There's another kind that before the beginning he had already determined. These aren't my kind of folks. What kind are they? They are any, anyone who, who raises up a voice or their power and presumes to stand against the Lord. If you presume to stand against the Lord, you're the kind that's already been declared as having been fulfilled. Anyone who presumes to stand against God. They have fallen. Well, in Rome, it was said, I heard it just again the other day on TV, 
all roads lead to Rome. And at that time, that's really what it thought, the way it was seen. Rome was the very center of the world. If you were going anywhere worth going, you were headed to Rome. They controlled all the power, all the trade, had all the influence. If you were going to do anything, accomplish anything, you better have Rome's approval. All roads lead to Rome, the center of everything. And it said at that time when people came to Rome, that's where everybody wanted to go because there was a new sinful delight around every corner. I mean, this is Mardi Gras to the max. We think, I had never been there. I don't want to be there. But people go to Mardi Gras, they say, you see and do anything, and you know. Well, Rome was like that. Every alley, every corner, just anywhere you go, there was a whole new immoral thrill. And all roads are headed there. And so, for that reason, Babylon has fallen. Of course, it's figurative language. Who's it referring to? It's referring to Rome. Why not just say Rome has fallen? Because it's veiled, isn't it? It's veiled. They would not, not going to believe it anyway, but it's veiled language, veiling the meaning to the Romans, and at the same time assuring the faithful of the certainty that our Lord is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, and all who are on the Lord's side are overcomers with him. What would the faithful recall? When he talks about Babylon has fallen, what would the faithful... First it talks about her drunkenness and her immorality and all these kings gathered together having this big party. What would the faithful recall when it says... Babylon has fallen. They'd likely recall ancient Babylon in the time of King Belshazzar. He gave, back in Daniel chapter 5, he gave this feast for all the kings. All those kings that he had essentially put in power, and thus they owe all their allegiance back to him. And it's like the worst form of the good old boys club you know you have your wealth and your privilege because I gave it to you and so you owe everything back to me in Daniel chapter 5 verses 1 through 4 there they are they're you know they're set to to party hardy look at Daniel chapter 5 verse 1 through 4 Belshazzar, the king, of a, held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and the silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from where? From out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Talking about the willful defiling of all that is holy to God. To use it in such a, desecrate it in such a manner. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. They drank the wine and they praised the God of the gold and the silver, the bronze and the iron and the stone. <coughs> What happens in the next verse? Suddenly the fingers of a hand, man's hand emerged. Began writing on the wall. It's like party on. Laugh your fool heads off all you want. Get drunk. Do whatever you... As you mock God by desecrating the things that are holy to Israel's God. Since the temple in Jerusalem is has been destroyed, the presumption is that the God of Israel was inferior to the gods of Babylon. 
And certainly in this time that's alluded to in, in Revelation 18, what's going to be the presumption of Rome? Israel's God is inferior to our gods. And when, especially when you put all of us kings together, surely we're stronger than God, don't you think? Particularly when you're, <laughs> you know, uh, inebriated. That's what they thought. But who put that thought in their hearts? Revelation 17 and verse 17. Who put it in their hearts? For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. This gives people trouble sometimes, that God put it in their hearts. Doesn't mean he's tempting them. Doesn't mean that he's causing them to do evil. What he has put in their heart, what's he put in people's heart? What they desire to receive. They've already proved their, their intention. They've already proved them their ways are wicked. It's what they desire to receive. When people go to Rome to look for immorality in every, around every street corner, when they're there with Belshazzar, doing all manner of immoral things, both in their worship and in their physical relationships, they've already put it in their heart. They've, I mean, they've already determined, what's God doing when it says he puts it in their heart? Giving them what they want. Affirming what they want. They've made their choice, have they not? God's affirming it. No, he's not forcing them. I'm not pulling up their exact verse right now. It's in, in Proverbs. For the wise, God has also put in the heart of the wise the fear of the Lord or the reverence for the Lord. Why? Because what have the wise already chosen? They've chosen to seek the knowledge and the understanding and to live by it and to practice the wisdom according to that word. They've made their choice. And so, this is what you've purposed. This is what you, what, this is what, how God is accomplishing his purposes in that. Everybody's got the choice, don't we? What do you want? What do you desire? That's what's really being affirmed, especially when you get to this time of judgment. These, these evil ones, these flagrant sinners who refuse to repent. God's not tempting them with such, heart, with such thoughts. He's, he's rather giving them what they had conceived. I think I mentioned week before last when we were... The, James 1, when lust is conceived, what is conceived with the lust? The seed of your own destruction. And so when lust is conceived, we read in Scripture about evil men lying on their beds at night and devising their evil plans and all that. Psalm 140 and verse 2, those who are devising evil are continually stirring up these wars. And so, as to spiritual warfare, God is putting it in their hearts to do what they are intent on doing it. It's much like before his cruci Christ's crucifixion. These men had already determined what they're going to do. Doesn't matter whose testimony said Jesus is innocent. And so by putting it in the heart, it's as much as saying, finish it. Go ahead, finish it. And it will be done. God's work is being finished. And so party on they did until that disembodied hand appeared and began writing on the wall. Remember what it said? Go to Daniel 5, verse 25. What's it say? Many, many tekel ifarsen. What's it literally mean? It all but literally says what it means. 
Literally, it is to number, to number, and to weigh, and to divide. Eupharsin means among the Persians. Count them, count them again. Don't you miss a one of them. Weigh them all out. Divided among the Persians. So four actions against those who are drunk on laughing at God. Number, number, weigh, and divide. What's it mean back there in Daniel 5 and verse 26? God had numbered Belshazzar's kingdom. All the nations in it, all the kings that he had set in power, everyone who is beholden to Belshazzar, all of them, and it says there, he'd numbered it, and this kingdom is at end. Verse 27, it has been weighed in the balances, Daniel 5, verse 27, it has been weighed in the balances. What do we know about God's standard of weights and measure? What's important to God throughout the... It's a true standard, isn't it? There's, there's nobody with their finger under, on the scale. Or, it, true, true weights and measure. And when it's weighed that way, what was found, what's discovered about them in that verse? They're found, pardon? They were found deficient. deficient. They didn't measure up. There wasn't something honest in it. They found wanting. Found wanting of what? They're lacking reverence for God. That's what they're wanting is they're, they're short. On, on reverence for God. Remember that I mentioned that verse. God has put in man's heart, the wise at least, a reverence for the Lord. These, these people just don't have it. Just, actually they have the exact opposite. This isn't just apathy. This is willful. They have no regard. And so in... Uh, Daniel 5, verse 30 and 31, Belshazzar, Belshazzar was killed, and at that time his kingdom was divided among the Medes and the Persians. So, what's the, the lesson back in ancient Babylon, or speaking figuratively of Rome in Revelation 18? What's the lesson? Laugh all you will, mock God till you're drunk, unreasoning in other words, but God has spoken. And God has judged. And so in Revelation 18 regarding Rome, the handwriting is on the wall. That's where that phrase came from. Handwriting is on the wall. And in short, it just means doomed. Doomed. In the original language. Uh, I can't read it for you in the original language, but it's said to read like a, like a beautiful poem. It's, it's modeled after many of the messages of doom in the, in the Old Testament. Interesting verse 1, this angel illumined the earth with his glory. This angel is shining the light. Talking about just weights and measures, when all this is weighed out, this angel coming, how clearly is that all going to be seen? He's illumining the earth. Causing all things to be seen clearly. Verse 2. It's, it, here it's announced. Let's see the progression throughout Scripture. Back in Isaiah 21, even there it was foretold. Babylon will fall. Revelation 14 and verse 4. Then it's announced. Foretold, announced. Here it's enforced. Already a done thing. And so, while Rome is reveling in her own glory, it's, it's already accomplished. I love that about prophecy. Already done. Still in the future, but already done. Her dwelling place. Her dwelling place, described there twice as a prison. And then described as an unclean and, and hateful Bird. Unclean and hateful could also be de uh, interpreted as vile and detestable. Well, vile and detestable is every power of man that presumes to stand up against God or pr presumes to deceive people 
or to trick people, cause people to follow after him. Why an unclean bird? First, why the word prison and the words unclean bird? Prison, throughout the Old Testament, you remember in the prophecies, even before they went into captivity, it, it spoke of those who are going to be trapped by their own... Solomon talks about it too. Those who are snared by their own words. They're trapped. They're, in fact, caging themselves. It means trap or cage, the word for prison. And so they've as much set the trap for themselves. And how, how, how firm is that trap? I mean, why can't they escape it? Because they have piled up their sins. It's not that there's just a little sin around them. They've piled it high. I mean, I guess it would be somewhat like getting caught in a whole tangle of barbed wire. There's no way you're getting out of that. You're not going to escape that. And so they're, they're, they've imprisoned themselves. Every unclean bird. I was looking up that word, the cage or trap. We find it 54 times from Genesis, from Exodus through 2 Timothy. That the, the wicked are trapped or ensnared by what they have set for themselves. Again, the matter of birds, there's, uh, back in Leviticus, there's talk of unclean birds and how they're cleaned. Even in the Levitical law of cleaning, you know, you took one bird, uh, cut the blood from one bird, ran it under the water, that would be clean. But these folks, this isn't that kind of bird. These people would have no part of that. It's speaking of those things that should not be eaten, and rather, in fact, will be thrown out. And so historical Babylon is that ancient place that by, that, you know, the faith would remember what happened to that place. By the first century, that glorious place, Babylon, it's just barely kind of a bump in the road. Just a little village there, bunch of deserted ruins, nothing inhabiting the place but a few wild animals and birds. Just a blip on the map. On the map. And so it's because, verse 3, the wine of Rome's passion. What is the wine of Rome's passion? Emperor worship. Emperor worship. Why are they worshiping? Interesting verse. Verse 3. For all the nations have drunk on the wine of the passion of her immorality. We're not talking about diluted wine in the holy sense. This is full strength. Full strength. Uncut. And the kings of the earth have committed acts of moral immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. It's all about monetary gain. Do you remember before ancient Israel, Judea was taken captive, what's happening right before that? Their priests, their leaders, their elders, anybody doing business would pervert the laws and the system of justice. They would steal from their own people. The poorest people among them, they would steal from them to enrich themselves. And that's what's happening with all these kings in, in Babylon or even back in Daniel chapter 5. Being made rich by all this winking of the eye to do these devious things among them. It, it's... The merchants' wealth and all the pleasure they could buy. And so it, it's, it's spiritual, spiritual prostitution for, for material gain. And those kings essentially are lining up, begging, in effect, begging to be seduced. It's what Paul talks about in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. That's the devotion to money for the specific reason of sordid gain. 
Nothing wrong with the money. Nothing wrong from just gaining by it. But this devotion for sordid gain. Nothing good in it. Revelation 14 and verse 4. I heard another angel from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. Um, chapter, Revelation 18, verse 4. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as the heaven. So I was talking about a minute ago, Beth this cage, this trap, this prison that they have built for themselves. They're walled in by this. There's no way they're going to escape the judgment of it. Piled high as the heavens and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back even as she has paid. Give back to her double according to her deeds. In the cup which she has mixed, mix twice as much for her. Because why? Because as she as much as she has glorified herself, well, to equal measure she will be brought to shame. And so there she is, trapped by her own sin, piled high around her. It's kind of like those shows about a hoarder. They got so much junk around them they couldn't begin to find their way out of the house. No way. And they're trapped. It's, a, it's another voice, another witness, another measure, messenger says, come out of her. How many times have we heard that call throughout the Bible? In every biblical age, patriarchal, mosaic, Christian age, and then at the very last day, come out, come out, come out, come out. What's the message? Come out and be separate from this kind of evil. It's, the, it's a message of sanctification. You are faithful, called to be sanctified, sanctified by God when you were, when you were first born into his family. You have gone back into that. Come out. There's still a lot that has to be changed even among the faithful who are waiting to be in the last day overcomers. Some of them are still being tempted and, and in all that persecution, some of them are going to turn and follow after such foolishness. What's the call? See, he's already pronounced the judgment past tense on the evil, but now we're speaking in a different tense. It's still presently possible for them to come out. Come out of there. 24 times throughout the Bible, it refers all the way back to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. In that case alone, how many times were messengers sent to urge the people to come out of that place? Just once? No. They were warned it was coming. But then there's a call, come out. There's another call. That time the angel actually goes in and bodily... <laughs> snags them out of it. And still the message has come out. And what did those few who were left there do? Laughed. Got to be kidding. Got to be kidding. Come out of that place. We see it again in Genesis 13. Abraham and his nephew Lot determined to go in different directions to pasture their flocks. Abraham let Lot have his choice. Lot, look whichever way you want. Whatever way looks good to you, it's all yours. And what did Lot see? He saw a lush valley of the Jordan. Looked like a place to enjoy a, a rich and a prosperous life. You know, man, everything would be good in, in that land. And it could have been. But that is the land where we find the many cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Nothing at all wrong with the land, but the kind of people who chose to live there, their intention of living. They're piling up sin in the cities. 
Genesis 13, verse 13. The men of Sodom, says, were exceedingly wicked. So Abram gets out of there, chapter Genesis 14, verse 22 and 23. Abraham gets Lot out of Sodom. And also, Abraham refuses to take from the king of Sodom anything that could be strewed, construed as ill-gotten wealth. He won't, the king is as willing to give him of this evil, this wealth, but Abram wants nothing, no part of it. He wants no benefit from those who are doing evil. So in Genesis 19, then two angels, two messengers come to Lot's house. In Genesis 19 and verse 14, because of the angel's message, Lot calls his sons-in-laws and his daughters to come out of that place. Like, get up, let's get out of here. But that call was rejected, wasn't it? The next day, there's another call to come out. This is when they say they, they literally grab the people who were t hesitating to pull them out of the city. Well, some are still hesitating in Revelation 18 and verse 4. Come out of her. Because like the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, Rome will be destroyed by fire. How severely again? Doubly severe. This is from where the, the saying comes, as, as we still hear some time, time today, paybacks are hell. They are. Paybacks are hell. What goes around comes around, and when it does, you're not going to bear it. You're not going to escape it. This is pay payback double. Double as strong as the undiluted wine of immorality that she compelled others to drink, and she had long imbibed in that strong drink. And like men might say today of some who are used to that, they, they can sure hold their booze. But let me tell you, when the judgment comes, that's going to be a tough time to sober up, isn't it? It's going to be a tough time. She'll not survive the doubling of God's wrath for her deeds. And so that last day judgment, it's a tough time to come to one's senses when you're drinking God's double strength wine. Always in the past it was measured, was it? A little bit diluted. Just enough to, to convince those whose minds and hearts could be changed that it's time to change. But when people have said, are not going to, full strength. Figuratively double strength. Again, to prove that those who stand against the power of God are nowhere as near as strong as they thought. We've seen it throughout the Bible, haven't we? God establishes his authority and power, his righteousness, his strength. He always lets another power rise up against it. They come against him and they come against him again doesn't matter how many are allied against God. What comes? Their destruction. Rome exceedingly gloried in her immorality. And more exceedingly will she perish in disgrace. Still the assurance is that the righteous are overcoming. But again, we've seen it in every biblical age. And the patriarchs come out of Sodom. Mosaic age come out of Babylon. Even when God, after the captivity, even when God provided the way for them to be delivered, he even paid the price for their redemption. He had the kings pay the price of restoring the city. There was nothing, no reason that faithful people wouldn't go back. How many chose to stay in Babylon? Remember the comparative number, how many went into captivity and how many came back? About 10%. Oh, a lot of them died in captivity, but just as many were born, they prospered there as well. But many of them said, no, we're going to stay there. We don't want to come out of what we have in Babylon. In the Christian age, come out of the sin of the world. 
Acts 7 and verse 7, they will come out and serve me in this place. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 17, come out of this place and be separate. That's what it's about. And until the very last day, there's that call, come out of this place. Because the judgment on those who remain there is already not only warned in Isaiah, not only announced in, in Revelation 14, but executed in Revelation 18. It's the call to sanctification. Come out. And what do we learn from Lot's wife? Don't even look back. Get out of there and don't even look back. Not even for a moment. That's that problem in Second Peter 2, verse 21 and verse 22. You know the passage. Those folks who return to sinning like the hogs and the dogs in the mud and the vomit. They went back. They looked at it. Didn't remain separate. And there they are. What's the implied message there for those who go back? Revel in that again. It would be better off for them not to have known the way than to go back to that. Hebrews 11 and verse 4, the faithful come out of that place because by faith, it says there, they desire a better country. Why would you go back? Somebody's going to have to tell me what time it is because this clock's way off. Were we about a quarter till? Okay, <laughs> we must be. From the beginning, from both before the beginning, God had already determined what kind of people would perish. It's already announced, it's already determined, essentially it's already been judged against them, it's as good as executed. But even until the last day, what's the call? Come out of that. Come out of that. As I so often mention, Jeff probably knows where I'm going, Hebrews 3 and verse 13. As long as it's still called what? You can come out of it. You can yet be changed. You can yet be separated from all of that evil and be reckoned as righteous.